Okay, focus on your breath. Breathe as deeply as you can. And notice where you feel the breathing process in the body. Let that be your anchor. Then if deep breathing feels good, keep it up. If not, you can change. Try more shallow breathing, fast, slow, short, long. As John Lee recommends sometimes trying in short, out long, or in long, out short. Whatever way of breathing seems to bring you a sense of balance. Because if you want to understand your mind, you have to watch it in the present moment. I mean, there are things you can learn by reflecting on how you used to think about things and the results that came from those thoughts, the intentions that you acted on and the results of those actions. But all too often our memories of the past are, are colored by other things. If you want direct knowledge, you have to watch your mind right here, right now. And so the breath is a good way of anchoring you in the present. There's no future breath you can watch, and there's no past breath you can watch. When you're with a sensation of breathing, you're in the present moment. Of course, the question is, why do you want to be in the present moment? It was to see your mind in action. We talk about having conviction. Conviction in the Buddha's awakening basically means conviction in our own power to act, and the, the power that our actions can have in shaping our lives. We want to make the most of that power. And it's all happening right here, right now. And often we look at our minds and realize that we act on all kinds of intentions. We have wise thoughts and unwise thoughts, perceptive, unperceptive. We have to learn how to make a distinction between those. As the Buddha himself said, he got on the path when he could divide his thoughts into two types. On the one hand, there were thoughts that were imbued with sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. On the other, there were thoughts that were imbued with renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness. He learned to step back from his thoughts. And this is important. This is a process called metacognition, M-E-T-A, where the mind can watch the mind. And can judge where your thoughts are coming from, what, what kind of mental attitude they're coming from, and then where they lead you. Now, whether you like them or not is not the issue. It's where they lead. They lead to a good place. As the Buddha said, you can encourage those thoughts. If they lead to a bad place, those are the thoughts that have to be discouraged. He made a comparison with a coward. During the rainy season, the cowherd has to keep careful watch off over the cows, because otherwise they get into the rice fields, eat up the rice, and then there'll be issues with the owners of the fields. So any thoughts that are unskillful, you, he said you beat them back the same way you would beat back the cows. Now we ordinarily don't hear that here in the West. That you should just learn how to accept what comes up in the mind, be okay, be non-reactive. Okay, well, there's skillful reaction and unskillful reaction. Unskillful reaction is when you get all upset. How can I be such a horrible person to think horrible thoughts like this? Remember, the fact that a thought appears in your mind is not a reflection of you as a person. It's just old karma. We all have good karma, bad karma, a big mix of it. Or you can think of it in a John Lee's image, as I mentioned just now. All sorts of germs going through your bloodstream. Some of them going through your brain, then we leave a thought here or there. The fact that there's a thought appearing doesn't reflect on you. It's what you do with it. 
in this case, it's a thought you see that's going to lead you to do something unskillful, then you put it aside and you do what you can to undercut it. And to undercut it, you have to do it in a skillful way. Again, you should deny that it's happening. You say, I possibly couldn't think a thought like that. That's not going to help. The thought's there. But you simply have to learn how to say no to it in a skillful way. The Buddha lists five ways of dealing with thoughts like this. One is simply noticing that the mind has gone to a place where it shouldn't go, and you just bring it right back. Seeing like, like you have a child, and the child is beginning to wander off into a dangerous, dangerously close to the road, you bring it back. Other times the child keeps wanting to go back to the road, back to the road. Then that's when you have to explain to the child, okay, that's a dangerous place to go. In other words, you look at the drawbacks of the thinking. You can ask yourself, if I thought thoughts like that for 24 hours, where would it take me? What would I do as a result? What would it do to my mind? And usually when you look at the drawbacks, he also has you look at the allure. Why do you like thoughts like that? And when you can see that the drawbacks outweigh the allure, and you can be honest with yourself about what the allure is, then you'll be more inclined to let them go. If that doesn't work, then let the thought go. Let the thoughts keep on thinking, but you're not going to go there with them. You're not going to get involved in that conversation. This is where it's useful to think of the mind as being like a committee. There are lots of people in the committee. When we talk about dealing with self and not self, you have lots of selves in the mind. Lots of opinions, lots of advice. But you realize okay, there's there's a lot of unskillful members of the committee, so you just don't get involved in the conversations. We can make another comparison. It's like a dog that keeps coming around to your house, begging for food. And as long as you feed it, it's going to keep coming. And the food for our thoughts is the fact that we attend to them. If you don't pay any attention to them, they go away. Our problem is that we find our thoughts fascinating. Everything that comes out of the mind has to be worth looking into. But when you realize, okay, the mind is just a, a thought generator, a random thought generator. And let it go th generating its random thoughts, whereas you don't get involved in that process. After a while, it begins to stop, just like the dog. If you don't feed it, it'll come around and it will whine and it will complain. But after a while, if it sees that you are, are not going to be feeding it at all, then it goes away. Or if you get more sensitive to the breath energy in your body, you begin to notice that when a thought comes through the mind, there'll be a pattern of tension, often in the head, but sometimes in other parts of the body as well. Kind of like a marker. And the marker is what allows you to keep that thought in mind. And if you release the tension, the thought goes. So if you can see there's a pattern of tension that it corresponds to this thought, just let it go. The Buddha calls this relaxing the fabrication of thoughts. And if that doesn't work, then you press your tongue against the roof of your mouth, you clench your teeth, and you tell yourself, I will not think that thought. In the forest tradition, they recommend taking a meditation word and repeating it really fast, like Bhutto is a common Meditation word means to be awake. And you just buto, 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 rapid fire like a machine gun. Jam the circuits. And then after a while, you you be away from the thought. This last method is the method of last resort because it requires a lot of willpower and not much discernment. And you can keep it up only for so long, but it can sometimes clear the air if you make a comparison with a toolbox. It's like having a sledgehammer in your toolbox and there are times when more refined tools don't work. But know that you've got a lot of different ways of keeping those cows in check. 
to keeping them out of the rice. Not just one technique. Because if you have just one technique, then your defilements can run around that technique and do what they want. They tell the story of the British defending Singapore during World War II. And they thought the Japanese would be coming by the sea, so they set their cannons aimed out at sea in concrete. And then it turned out the Japanese came down the Malay Peninsula from behind. The cannons were useless. So it's good to have different th ways of dealing skillfully with your thoughts. As a variation of that second technique, the technique of seeing the drawbacks of the thoughts. I found one that's useful, asking yourself, if this thought that I'm involved in were a movie, would I pay to see it? And usually not. The acting is horrible, the script is pretty bad. Then why bother thinking it? As for thoughts that are skillful, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non ill will, thoughts of harmlessness. The Buddha said it was like looking after cows during the dry season. The rice has been harvested and put away. There's no more danger of the cows going into the rice fields because the rice fields are empty of rice. So they can wander where they like. The cowherd sits under the tree, and all he has to be conscious of is those cows are someplace by the time to call them in. In the same way, you can keep track of your thoughts, but not have to worry about them. However, thinking a lot gets the mind tired, which is why the Buddha said the best thing to do is to get the mind into concentration. That's when you gather the cows in. Because if the mind is tired from thinking, sometimes it'll start thinking unskillful thoughts and it'll be difficult to keep them under control. So you let the mind rest. Find an object where you can just stay quietly here in the present moment. It can be thoughts of goodwill, focusing on the breath. Whatever topic you find congenial is a place where the mind can get some rest. Now as you do this, you're getting the mind into concentration. It will involve some thinking to begin with. You think about the breath. Say you're taking the breath as your object. You think about the breath, and then you evaluate how, how good is the breath? How does it feel? If you're focusing on the breath sensations in your head, make a thorough survey of your head. Every little muscle that you think of in your face, in your neck, in your back of the neck. Think of the whole head being nourished by the way you breathe. Think of the breath energy coming in from all directions. Every little cell in the head is breathing in, breathing out. Then extend that perception as far as you can through the body. This involves thinking and involves evaluating. Or to put it in other terms, it involves talking to yourself. But you're talking to yourself in a constructive way. I know people have come to me and asked, this directed thought and evaluation, how do I start doing that? And the answer is, well, you're doing it all the time already. It's simply a question of bringing it to the topic of the meditation in a skillful way. So you get the mind to be snug with the, the breath, snug with the, whatever the object is. They feel good together. And as they feel good together, then you can stop the talking and just be together. But the process of doing this, you realize you're, you're learning both tranquility and you're beginning to develop some insight. We often hear that tranquility and insight are two separate types of meditation. But the Buddha never taught it that way. He said, as you get the mind into concentration, it requires that you develop tranquility. It requires that you develop some insight. And in the same way, once the mind gets into concentration, your tranquility gets stronger, your insight gets stronger. So we're doing the concentration, and we're bringing these qualities, qualities of mind to the concentration to develop it, and they get developed in the process. 
the questions of tranquility basically are, how do I get the mind to settle in? How do I get it to be unified? How do I get it to be steadied and concentrated? So you try to find a way of breathing that it's easy to settle in with. We can stay steady when the different parts of the mind can get unified around it. As you figure that out, that's how you get the mind to be tranquil. Now the insight has to do with the processes of fabrication, and those are involved as well. The questions here are how do you re how do you regard fabrications, how do you investigate them, and how do you see them with insight? You can regard fabrications either as the five aggregates, as form, feeling, perception, fabrication itself, and consciousness. Whether there's another list called the three fabrications. There's bodily fabrication, which is the breath, verbal fabrication, directed thought and evaluation, mental fabrication, perceptions and feelings. And these are things that are all involved in doing the concentration. In terms of the five aggregates, you've got the, the body here that you're focused on. That's form. The breath coming in, breath going out, that's form. There's a feeling of ease that you're trying to develop. There's a perception of how the breath goes through the body. When it comes in, where does it come in? When it goes out, where does it go out? How does it go through the body as it's coming in going out? What kind of perception helps you to settle down with the breath so it feels easy all the way in, all the way out? I found the perception that it's not the case that the solid parts of the body are there before the breath. The breath is there before. That way the breath can go everywhere. It's prior. Or as I said earlier, the perception that every cell in the body is breathing in, breathing out together. Then there's the fabrication of your directed thought and evaluation, your intentions around getting the mind to settle down. And then consciousness, which is aware of all these things. So you've got all five aggregates right here as you practice concentration. The same with the three three types of fabrication. You've got the breath, this bodily fabrication, try to thought and evaluation, talking to yourself about the breath, verbal fabrication, perceptions and feelings, again, mental fabrication, they're all here too. So how do you investigate them? In the beginning, you investigate them as they may start wandering away from the concentration. In other words, a thought appears in the mind, and you try to see, okay, what's the origination of this thought? What sparks this thought? Is it greed, aversion, delusion? Is there a perception that sparks it? What's the origination? How does this come about? The word origination is samudaya. What, what arises together with a thought? And then you look at it go away. When the cause goes away, then the thought goes away. But then the mind may go back to it, and you want to know why. This is, this is why you want to look at the allure. What's, what's the appeal of these thoughts? Some thoughts are pretty random. They don't have much appeal. They just have to be, as I said, random, randomly generated thoughts. Other thoughts have an appeal, and sometimes you don't want to admit the appeal to yourself. But the more honest you are, say, oh, it's, this thought comes to my mind and I go back to it because I like it for this reason or that reason, then you can do something about it. That's when you look at the drawbacks and comparing the allure with the draw drawbacks, it really does hit home that it's not worth it. What you thought you were getting out of the thought is not worth all the trouble that it's causing. And when it really hits home, it, that's the escape. Yesterday we were talking about cutting, dependent, co-arising. The Buddha never talks about cutting, dependent, co-arising. He talks about escaping from it. And this is how you escape. So that's how fabrications are to be investigated. So, that's, so it's to escape from them. But before you investigate them, to escape from them, in the concentration you develop them. So you get to know, what is a 
feeling? What is a perception? What is fabrication? How do these things function in the mind? It's like learning about the ingredients of a cake. You've got the eggs, you've got the flour, you've got all kinds of things. And it's by working with them and making different kinds of cakes that you learn a lot about eggs and flour and the other ingredients. Then finally the question is, how are they to be seen with discernment? Here again, you start out with dealing with distractions from your concentration. And just now we're talking about looking at the drawbacks. Seeing fabrications in terms of their drawbacks is what liberates you from them. So you look at them in terms of being inconstant, stressful, not self. In other words, you can't rely on them, and when they're not reliable, trying to hold on to them is stressful. As for not self, it's a value judgment. You realize that this is not worth holding on to. Any disturbance that comes in, you learn to see it in these terms. You free yourself from those disturbances, and that makes your concentration stronger. And finally, the day will come when the only thing that you're holding on to now is the concentration. And you turn the same analysis on that, you see that it too, even though it's a lot more constant than anything else you had in your mind, it too has its in moments of inconstancy. It too has its subtle stress. And it too is not worthy of claiming as you or yours. That's how the mind gets totally freed. But in the meantime, you want to develop the concentration. So that analysis really does have an impact. You can hear the words right now, and they make sense. But if they don't do the work, then it's a sign you need to work more on your concentration. In which you'll be developing more tranquility, developing more insight. And see, so you want to find this fascinating how your mind creates suffering for itself, even though it doesn't want to, but it does it. Why on earth would that be? Well, because you're not, you don't know what's going on. You've paid much more attention to things outside, not enough attention to your own mind. And this is dangerous, because things outside can do only so much damage to you, but it's your own mind that can do real damage. But at the same time, it can do a lot of help, give you a lot of help. So take an interest in this. If you do the concentration with a sense of interest, you will develop both tranquility and insight together. And that's how you learn to train the mind to stop creating its, its suffering. So it's no longer a burden to itself. We have our burdens outside. Those are plenty, plenty enough. Why do we add more burdens on top of ourselves? Well, it's because of ignorance. And this is how you overcome your ignorance, by bringing the mind to tranquility and developing insight through the practice of concentration. So as Vasugaki used to say, are you interested in this? It's hard to think of anything in the world that could be more interesting than the mind's own ability to hide things from itself. And its own ability to overcome that habit, to see through that habit. We take joy in the skills that we can develop. Try to take joy in this skill as well. <laughs>